Welcome to our webinar, Gauged Porcelain Tile Systems. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. This is an AIA accredited presentation, so if you have not already provided your AIA registration number and would like credit for attending today's session, please be sure and provide your number and your contact information in the question and answer box on the right-hand corner of your screen. And speaking of that box, please also type any questions that you may have and we'll address them at the end of today's presentation, time permitting, or via an email afterwards. Now, without any further delay, let me introduce today's speaker, Mike Granitowski. Mike is the Director of Architectural and Commercial Projects for MAPE. He's a graduate of the University of Arizona, where he studied architecture and graduated with a degree in business administration. Mike's worked in the flooring industry for more than 40 years and has specialized in tile and stone installation systems. He's also been involved with the installation, distribution, and sales with a focus on design professionals. Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jen. Good, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon in some cases. Um, welcome to the presentation. Again, uh, my name is Mike Ranitowski, the director of the architectural program uh, for MAPE. Um, today's uh, presentation, as Jen said, is an AIA continuing education. So if you haven't registered or getting your number uh, into us, please do so at the end of the presentation. Also, this is IDCEC approved, and sending in that information will get you your accreditation uh, for that as well. Um, if you have any questions regarding either of those, please reach out to us and we'll help you out with that. So today's presentation, we're going to be talking about gauged porcelain tile systems, gauged porcelain tiles in the large format tiles, and where we're going with these tiles and how the industry is adjusting to uh, the size of these tiles and the definition of these tiles and just what we're dealing with in both in the makeup of the tile and the installation of the tile. Um, our learning objectives today is we're going to understand the product and the installation standards. And there are new product and installation standards for these gauge porcelain tile systems. The benefit of re referencing them in your specification. And that's as, as architects and designers are listening in on this today, as you start putting together specifications for these large uh, gauge porcelain tile systems, referencing the right standards so that you're getting the right product and understanding the reasoning that you're using these new reference numbers. We want to understand the, uh, how it, it is important to follow the tile and setting material manufacturer's recommendations. So as you're looking at these tiles and understanding it might be the color, the design, the size that you want, that your client is expecting, but what are the manufacturer, manufacturer's recommendations for the installation? Can it be used in the area you want it to be used in? And what are the right setting materials to being used and how will it be installed to making sure that your client ends up with the installation that they're expecting? You're going to learn the importance of making sure the type of installation is, in, is approved for its intended use and the rating for whether it's for a floor, for a wall, interior, exteriors, and the type of service you expect out of it. So although a product may look like uh, you can use it on a floor. Is it really suited for a floor? Is it suited for a heavy use on floor? Or is it more lighter residential type use and understanding the differences in that? Um, we wanna have a discussion on why you might consider gauge porcelain tile for your project in areas that you, not, you haven't used tile in the past. Understanding the effect of environmental conditions both during and after the installation. So all of these things are, are points that we have to take into consideration as we look at using a gauge porcelain tile systems. When we take a look at the manufacturing of the uh, process of the tile, how tile was made previously, how it's being made now, understanding the differences and the changes in this manufacturing process are allowing us to make these larger and larger paneled tiles. The picture in the upper right is of a traditional dust press tile being manufactured. Uh, the powder is poured into a die or a, or a form, and it's compressed at 5,000 to 7,500 tons PSI, forming a particular size tile, um, 
uh, whether it's an 8 by 8, 12 by 12, 24 by 24, whatever size it may be, but it's the dust press method. The picture in the upper left is a, is a gauge porcelain tile being manufactured. The, po the powder is poured into a conveyor belt unrestrained. The powder is then compressed at over 10,000 ton PSI. Considerable difference in the amount of compression between a dust press tile and the gauge porcelain tiles. The lower left is a graphic design being added to a glazed porcelain tile. So in other words, we're getting a pattern put into that tile in the pressing system. And then on the bottom right-hand side, we're seeing is a, the back of a glazed porcelain tile receiving reinforcing mesh. And the reinforcing mesh is not used on all of the products, but it is used on, on a number of the products, depending upon the manufacturer and depending upon the overall thickness of the porcelain panel that's being installed. So those are the differences in the manufacturing, but the biggest thing is, is the amount of compression the PSI uh, that is used to uh, making uh, these gauge porcelain panels. There's a difference between the technologies that are, that are being used and implemented in making these larger panels. Um, there are two different technologies. It's the lamina, which is uh, the powder is put into a form and pressed, or the continuum process, which is the powder is, um, is placed between rollers and the, um, it's rolled out between the, uh, the, as a sheet in between this roller. In a continua, continua technology, you can make a panel, if, if you had the warehouse space long enough and the conveyor belt long enough, uh, it, it could be a mile long. Um, uh, whereas in the lamina, it's still a press in a, a form and the form is, is typically is uh, predetermined. So those are the two differences, but basically the density of the products is ending up being the same. When we're looking at the current range and size of these tiles, um, we're typically seeing all the way up to a meter by three meters or five foot, uh, as large as five foot three by 10 foot five. The thickness of these pro products um, is, is variable. We're seeing anything from three uh, millimeter all the way up to 6.5 millimeter. Um, and then with or without the reinforcing mesh. The manufacturers determines whether or not they want the mesh on it. The mesh adds an additional strength, especially as the um, uh, large panel is uh, moved um, in bending, that uh, the mesh is helping prevent it from cracking or breaking. Um, typically, manufacturers have smaller sizes as well as these large panels. Um, we're seeing uh, various size squares and uh, various size planking, uh, all considered in this large format in the various thicknesses. The, this technology that we're seeing it does have staying power. It's the, it's the way that manufacturers are now producing products, um, and there's a lot of innovation that has happened during this um, change in these manufacturing processes. Uh, there's less raw materials. Uh, they're pressing this down as thin as three millimeters. Uh, um, so, but the, the strength of that product, um, even at three millimeters, has considerable strength. So you're using less raw materials, less energy to produce it. Being thinner and lighter weight, you're spending less expensive on the product to shipping the product. Uh, you're getting more square footage in a container or onto a pallet. So again, re reducing carbon footprint in just in the shipping cost. The thinner material is easier to cut and drill. And then we're seeing a variety of sizes and shapes that can be made from one panel. This becomes very much like um, what happens in the stone industry where they'll cut out a large panel of stone and then cut that down to the various sizes in a cut to, cut to fit type project. So you're seeing the same thing with these large panels a large panel may be produced, and then it's cut down to um, smaller squares or planks or other sizes to accommodate the needs of a particular job. So this technology um, it keeps uh, evolving. 
um, it keeps uh, moving forward and becoming easier for the manufacturer to making uh, a wider variety of tile shapes and sizes. So now as we, we take a look at the, the uh, product that we're dealing with, uh, the industry has taken a look at it and we've come up with standards for the gauge porcelain tile and gauge porcelain tile panel slash slabs. And looking at the difference between what we're classifying as a panel or a slab versus a tile. ANSI standard, the new ANSI standard is A1, ANSI uh, 137.3 is the tile standard um, when we talk about these gauge porcelain tiles. And the installation standard is ANSI 108.19. Keeping that in mind, there's an actual installation standard now when we're talking about these gauge porcelain panels. Um, and being able to reference that in your specification is very important rather than just calling out the product's name, size, and color. So why are the product standards important? It, product standards are important to establish a quality level of the established products that we know have been successfully used in the US. So instead of just bringing in a tile and calling it a gauge porcelain panel, um, the, the panel has to meet certain, the ANSI standards so that we know that we're getting the right quality that your client, the end user, is gonna be pleased with what they're gonna end up with on their job. It's gonna perform the way that they expect it to perform at a level that they're expecting uh, to achieve from this product. Uh, it's to build a confidence in the new tile product uh, category. By having a standard, referencing back to a standard, your client, uh, the end users, can uh, rest assured that the product meets testing standards, which we'll discuss in a, a few minutes, that the product is going to perform the way they're expecting it to, per, to perform. Uh, we will establish a reference standard by which specifiers can specify the quality level needed to perform based on their project needs. So as a specifier, you as an architect and as a designer pulling these specs together, you know that by calling out to these standards, both in the standard for the, the uh, quality of the tile and the performance level of the installation, you are going to end up with uh, a performance on this project, what you've expected. Moving along. So when we take a look at the ANSI one, A137.3, the correct terminology is gauged. This was uh, an emphasis on the thickness where thickness is critically. Uh, currently focused on thin, but could also be thick. Due to a consensus process, the official name is gauge porcelain tile and gauge porcelain tile panel or slash slabs. Some wanted gauge porcelain tile panels, others wanted slabs. So consensus came up with um, the variation between the two. A gauge porcelain tile is less than one square meter. So anything less than a square meter is classified as a gauge porcelain tile. Whereas a gauge porcelain tile panel or slab is one square meter or larger. So playing with the differences in sizes. And what we're seeing is typically the demand is for the larger and larger panels or slabs and the use of that. The gauge part is similar to what we see in other construction where we talk about the gauge of wire, the gauge of metal, the gauge of um, sheet metal in air condi conditioning ducts. So we're playing with the thickness and that's the gauge part of it that we're playing with in the same terminology. When we look at the product standard, um, the product standard encompasses a number of things. Table four in the standard, if you were to pull out the standard, products with a nominal thickness of five millimeters to 6.5 millimeters for floors and walls with or without mesh uh, reinforcement. Um, they have to also, if they have a mesh reinforcement on it, they have to pass a seven day submersion test to making sure that the bond strength of the mesh onto the material will hold up. Um, the mesh reinforcement products also have a mesh tested for the absorption. Products in table five, products with a nominal thickness of 3.5 to 4.9 millimeters with mesh for walls. 
But typically these thinner materials, the 3.5 up to 4.9 or just under five millimeters are used for wall applications. Um, the thicker materials are used for wall or for floor applications, keeping that in mind. Um, I'm often asked, can a thinner material be used on the floor? That'll be up to the manufacturer of that material to verify if they would accept it for the floor application. Um, um, check with the manufacturer if you're going to use a thinner material on a floor application. Um, moving along on this. Part of the uh, standard on the uh, to determining the suitability of the product is the Robinson uh, floor testing. Um, the system testing with the Robinson floor testing. This is uh, follows ASTM six C six twenty seven. This is the first time this system test has been included in a tile product standard. In the, in your previous testing standards for other tile, we've never referred back to the Robinson floor testing. For this um, gauge porcelain tiles and panels, now the Robinson floor testing is part of the overall uh, testing of the product and making sure it's suitable for the intended application for uh, floor loads. The Robinson test subjects the tile assembly to increasingly rigorous loading. Um, more and more weight added to it um, with different types of wheel until the rupturing of the system. And that'll give this the system a rating, whether it's light residential uh, all the way up to heavy commercial use. So being um, aware of that in the type of rating that we're getting out of that uh, product standard. The other thing that we look at is minimum breaking strength. Um, table four, that your thicker materials have a, hundred, a minimum of 175 pound um, minimum breaking strength. Products in table five have an 85 pound uh, breaking strength. And then all of them have a module of rupture of 6,000 PSI on all of these products to making, for, to meeting the standard to um, meet the ANSI 1, A137.3 product standard. So installation benefit. So when we're taking a look at these large panels, um, both as a tile form or as a large panel or slab. It's ideal for renovation of floors, walls, countertops, and exteriors. Uh, innovative applications can be used on curved surfaces, interior design applications, and we're seeing a lot of people using this for furniture and accents. Um, wrapping furniture, I actually saw a complete kitchen done where all of the um, uh, finished surfaces on the cabinetry or uh, was done with these uh, gauge porcelain panels. Um, they can be used for countertops and vanities as well. Um, excellent for the renovation of walls, countertops, and floors. Um, the thinner material can uh, typically wrap into curved areas um, because of the flexibility of this material. Um, so it gives uh, you as a designer a lot of innovation as to where you can use these products, not only on the typical walls and floors or an accent wall, but now by uh, creating a, a desk area, a furniture area, a countertop area with the same type of material or complementary material. Um, some of the other installation benefits, exterior facade and raised access floor systems. Um, this Thin in tile innovation is ideal for, for tile over tile. When we're doing a tile over tile installation, because the tile is, these panels are so much thinner, um, uh, we're not in greatly increasing the overall thickness of the floor. We're saving on the removal of existing uh, tile, the, the cost of the tear out, the mess, the dust, the noise, uh, whereas we can go in putting down a primer and bonding this tile over the existing well-bonded older tile. Definitely increase, um, improving the overall look of the installation and uh, saving a lot of time in tear out, cost in tear out, a cost in um, taking this torn up tile and setting materials to landfill. And then of course, um, not creating all of the dust and the mess in the installation. 
typically with the thinner tiles, uh, we uh, existing doors typically do not need to be cut or trimmed. Uh, you'll have enough clearance with uh, the doors, so very easily can put down a new flooring um, on a floor in installation and not uh, having to worry about changing out uh, um, door height or uh, to, um, uh, the toe kicks around cabinetry also. So there are many sizes and styles and graphics available today, so we can start seeing patterns being cut into this tile. You can see various geometric designs being used in, in cutting and placing these products. Um, uh, a shadowing type effect, uh, cutting the material, and of course the various size panels and some of the accent work that can be done with this. And not only uh, walls, uh, cabinetry, shelving type units, giving a, a very much of a, a contemporary look, a, a very nice design appeal to it. Makes for a very nice visual impact um, using planking on a floor and large panels overhead and on the columns. A very a nice contemporary look. Um, again, an accent wall, uh, cabinetry, entry desk, uh, giving a, um, a, a clean look to it. The remodeling, tile over tile, as I mentioned before, one huge benefit and cost savings can be the tile over tile. The number of days in labor that can be saved by um, not tearing out the existing tile, but by going directly over, uh, over the tile. Um, and face it, time is money, especially in these days as we're looking at how do we get jobs done quicker, uh, where we have less time, time on job sites now. Um, can we save time and money by, by tiling directly over an existing tile, um, not having to go through the cost of tear out, the, the expense of dumping this uh, torn out material, uh, the airborne dust, and getting the job done faster. And in this day and age where we can't man a job uh, with as many people, um, here's a way of getting the job done and still meeting the uh, time constraints that may be on, on a particular job. Um, the larger tile is definitely a, a refreshing, more contemporary look. Uh, we're minimizing grout joints, um, which is a shame our company makes grouts, but uh, um, you know, and when you ask the designer, uh, you know, how many of you want to see more grout joints? Uh, nobody raises their hand. Everybody is looking for less grout joints, more of that clean, contemporary, solid mass look. And then by going into fewer grout joints, becomes ease of maintenance for these larger tiles to uh, keeping that finished project clean and uh, a neat look to it. When we take a look at uh, tile over tile, this is a picture of an outdated showers at Holy Cross Hospital in Fort La Lauderdale. Um, on the right, uh, those showers are using a tile over tile and with a bond promoting primer. And the, the glazed porcelain or the gauge porcelain um, tile gives it a much cleaner look, a more contemporary look, bringing it up to date without the expense of tearing out that uh, four and a quarter tile that was installed back in the 70s um, and uh, now what we're doing is giving it a more of a modern look, cleaner look, uh, easier to maintain uh, product. Um, this is a shot, a beauty shot of what we've done with uh, tiling over an existing door and changing the look of, uh, of the door. The panel being a lighter weight, being only three uh, millimeters thick, is not adding a, a lot of weight to that door, bonded directly to it in a, a cleaner, uh, modern look to it. Um, using it as a radius, what we're seeing is on the uh, convex of, uh, uh, of a curve or the concave of a curve um, following the bend of it or around a column where the um, uh, panels are scored, uh, snapped and, and going around the tight radius of a, of, of a column. So again, a very clean, uh, application um, using these gauge porcelain panel um, products. And then here's another example of a countertop. And on the countertop, is just like using a natural stone, what we're doing with this is we can match the patterns and bookmark 
uh, the uh, panel uh, and making it look like um, uh, an actual stone rather than, the, uh, than um, a manufactured product. Um, a couple of years ago at the Stone Fair in Verona, um, they actually had these panels on display, which was new to that show uh, because it represents stone so well that on first glance, you can't tell if it's a natural stone or not. You have to go up and really inspect it to tell that it was a gauge uh, uh, porcelain panel and not a real stone. So there's a lot that can be achieved at a lot less cost than a natural stone. So when we start, we now we, we've looked at the um, ANSI standards for the product itself, and we understand what the product, the makeup of the product, the quality of the product. Now we're going to take a look at the installation standards. And there's in ANSI 108.19, the installation standards for the gauge porcelain panel, there's 20, sub, 20 sections, and we're going to go over a number of these sections and the purpose of these sections. And the reason I bring this up and this is so important that you're including this into the specification that off, way too often you'll go to a job and you'll hear somebody say, well, I've been installing tile for X number of years. I know how to install tile. I, I don't need to be told how to get this done. Well, we're installing something that's completely different than that 8 by 8, that 12 by 12, that 16 by 16 floor tile or wall tile that was used for many, many years, when we're starting to get into these gauge porcelain panels, the differences in installation methods greatly change, and this needs to be paid attention to and needs to be specified properly so that we don't see a failure with these larger panels. So we're going to be covering substrate, substrate flatness and general requirements, job site material handling, uh, tile specification and ordering, contractor qualifications, the mortar and the mortar application, very critical as we're specifying the right type of mortar and how it's applied. Making sure the tile is properly embedded on the walls and floors, making sure we're getting the right coverage, and we talk about coverage, grouting, workmanship, lippage, grout joint size, movement joints, um, damage to tile work and maintenance. Um, we're gonna be going uh, over these, not all 20 of these, but we're gonna be going over 13 of these uh, different installation um, uh, methods, uh, talking a little bit about them and understanding the importance of that. Um, typically at this point, uh, there's always somebody that'll ask, well, what about um, exterior applications? Is there a standard for that? Um, yes, there is a standard that has come out. Uh, it has not been, um, uh, it has been released. Um, it, 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 you've not seen it into the ANSI book yet. When the ANSI book is rewritten, it will be in that, but there is a standard for the exterior application. What we're talking about mostly today here is on the interior applications. This is what we're focusing pre uh, predominantly uh, today. So when we take a look at the installation standard, uh, the general requirements uh, are the same. The floor surfaces. Uh, TCNA, ANSI recognizes that tiles with one edge of 15 inches or longer, the maximum variation in the substrate is an eighth of an inch and 10 feet with no more than the 16th of an inch and 24 inches. Well, in the past, our variation was a quarter of an inch in 10 feet. And then when we started defining a large format tile, and we defined it as having one edge 15 inches or longer, uh, the variation is, is um, we uh, made it more stringent in bringing it to this eighth of an inch and 10 feet. It's important to realize that your concrete guy, is he going to give you a slab that's going to be that flat? And if not, to the understanding that some surface prep is going to need to be done to making sure that the substrate is flat enough prior to the installation of the tile. And that is done with products and not the mortar that's used to bonding the tile, but uh, self-leveling underlayments, patching mortars, to getting that substrate flat enough uh, before the tile is actually installed. Uh, the section five, the substrate flatness, no different uh, than current industry standards. So again, the current, the standards in the in industry do not change for these uh, uh, gauge porcelain tiles, recognizing that 
when you're getting into these that you're working with a substrate that needs to be an eighth of an inch and 10 feet uh, as your standard. Substrate requirements. Um, there's a number of things to be taking into consideration in, um, in moving and prepping and getting ready to, to uh, place these panels. These panels are large. Uh, the installer needs more room to work with the panels to, um, uh, to get them ready to be put up onto the wall or onto the floor, and that, that there needs to be adequate room to work. Um, there must be protection of finished tile work with appropriate time for curing before traffic is allowed. We're going to talk a little more about protection at, towards the end of this presentation, but allowing for seven days of pedestrian or production before pedestrian or wheeled traffic. Uh, when concentrated loads like scissor lifts or forklifts are um, going to be going over the finished product, a suitable protection uh, layer should be put down and adequate cure time. Making sure that this is all a part of this standard, this is part of this installation standard in 108. Point one nine. The, the material handling requirements. This is also taken into consideration because these panels, are, based on the size of them, forklifts need to have longer bars on them. Otherwise, they go to pick up these long, these uh, a, a pallet of these larger panels, and if it isn't properly supported, these panels could snap if they uh, flex too much in the um, while we're moving the panels, getting them into place to start working with them. Using the right type of um, uh, tools to picking up the panels. And typically, what we're using are suction cup frames for the larger sizes. These are necessary. And if it's a textured surface on the panel, that we're using is uh, re uh, specially designed suction cups. So it's a framework similar to what you see the glazers using and moving around uh, sheets of glass and getting them into position. The same type of um, of a framework with suction cups on it, moving these panels around so that uh, two men can uh, adequately move a panel into place. So we're seeing here, uh, again, moving the, uh, um, the full-size pieces come in oversized crates, extended forks must be used so that uh, we're not snapping the product while we're moving it around on a job site. Pre-plan, on how to deliver full-size pieces to the installation site. Remember, an elevator may be too small to get these panels in, so that um, uh, having the right opening um, and, and stocking a, a floor before walls are completely enclosed and having those panels up there, because you may not be able to get them into the elevator once everything is enclosed, the project is completely enclosed. Um, Again, this is pointing out the, the use of the proper type of suction cups frames for lifting the larger sizes um, and the, using texture, uh, if it's a textured surface, making sure the suction cups can work on a textured surface and moving these panels into place. Very critical part of, of moving these panels around. The other thing that is very important is recognizing um, the qualifications of the installing contractor. Um, the, specify a contractor that is knowledgeable about this type of installation and has the proper equipment. The, this installation standard 108.19 uh, has in this that, that the contractor is qualified. Just because he's been installing tile, quarry tile, uh, 12 by 12 tile, 24 by 24 tile for years, doesn't mean he's qualified to putting up these larger panels of tile. There's more involved into it in making sure that the proper installation is done um, and that he's gone through the proper training. Specify that, uh, that the installer has gone through an advanced certification for tile installers, which certifies that the installer, not just his company, but the installer himself has had the training and understands how to in properly install these panels. Specify installers, that have completed a comprehensive installation program. And then taking a look, there may be other programs that are approved um, um, by the specifier, but that the installer himself has gone through the proper training to understand how he's placing these panels in and giving you an ad adequate installation. Um, again, part of the general requirements for the installation. 
Uh, do not install over unsatisfactory surfaces. We've already talked about that the substrate needs to be flat, making sure that that's done. Qualify the type of membrane if using one. Are we using a crack isolation membrane, a sound deadening membrane, a self-leveling underlayment that it's suitable for this type of installation and that yet you're developing a compatible installation that all of the pieces are gonna work together. Make sure that the tile or the panel is suitable for the type of application. Just because it's the right color that your client wants and it's the right shape, is that product suitable for a heavy use floor? Is it suitable for um, uh, a wall application or in being used in a wet application? Making sure that the manufacturer of that panel is, is certifying that that product can be used where you intend on using it. Um, Will it hold up if it's being uh, put down a floor for heavy uh, commercial traffic, uh, pallet jacks being rolled over it, um, uh, forklifts being rolled over it? Um, remember, if you're using it in a mall um, and they come to decorate in the uh, and changing things out in the mall and they're running scissors lift on the on the floor, will it take that type of loads, making sure that it's suitable for those types of uses? Also in the installation standards, the application of the bonding mortar. Um, all of us have seen the typical uh, trowel and you've probably all done some tile work around your houses and you've gone out and bought a square notch trowel or a V notch trowel to putting down the mortar. And um, um, uh, you've spread your mortar, you've placed your tile into it and you've um, assured that you're getting the full coverages. With these larger, panels and these larger format tiles, we've got to use a different type of trowel. And the purpose of this is that we want to make sure that the trowel is giving us uh, as close to full coverage that, uh, that we can get. And by using uh, the right type of trowel, this is going to assure this is going to be uh, achieved. We want to make sure that the surface um, substrate is surface dry, surface saturated, but dry. In other words, that uh, as we're spreading the mortar into it, that the substrate isn't sucking all of the moisture out of the mortar, but it's allowing time for the mortar to properly cure into the substrate and to lock onto the back of the tile. The use of these special trowels require that, um, that the mortar is already uh, curling over so that as you're pre pressing the tile down into the mortar, you're achieving a full um, or a close to full coverage that the tile itself is not riding on the ridges of the mortar. And often I, as I'm talking about uh, installation te techniques and practices, I'll challenge an architect to tell an installer, lift up the piece of the tile as they're putting it down. If you're still seeing ridge marks, you're not getting near the right coverage. And then we have to make sure that that tile, as it's placed into this mortar, um, and with a regular tile, it's rocked back and forth to making sure the ridges are breaking down. These larger panels, you can't rock them back and forth. So consequently, how do we break the ridges down? And the use of these trowels where the mortar is starting to roll over achieves that, uh, that proper application. So the other step that we're doing is that we'll key in the mortar onto the back side of the, of the on the panel of uh, the back side of the panel and also onto the substrate prior to combing this, the mortar onto the, onto the panel and onto the substrate to making sure we're getting as close to a full coverage as possible. I'm gonna talk a little bit about cover. Here's a shot of the different types of trowels um, uh, that are used for this type of application. And again, this by calling out this installation specification, the installer who's been trained in this knows these are the type of trowels to use, making sure that the right application and the right coverage is being achieved to making sure the application is good. Mortar on the tile and the substrate should have ridges parallel to each other. So as they're combing onto the substrate, they're combing in one direction and onto the tile the same direction. So as we're placing it together, it becomes like uh, Velcro, they're locking together or like a big zipper uh, filling in between so that um, they're not cross hatched over one another. And this again allows for good bond and getting um, 
uh, proper coverage onto the, onto the panel and onto the substrate. Overspread, overspread the footprint of the tile to adequately support the edges. So when they're combing, if you look at that picture, they're combing the mortar onto the panel, they're getting all the way over the edge of the, uh, the panel. So when they pick it up and place it into, onto the wall or onto the floor, um, there's not a void along the edge of the tile, which on a floor application can be a problem as it point loads later on, and then this prevents a breaking of the edge of the tile. And uh, if you have breaking along the edge, you're not replacing a square foot of tile. You, play, you can be replacing as you know, a three foot by 10 foot panel, that's 30 feet of tile that would need to be replaced if one edge cracks um, after it's been installed. You'll notice that when they trowel, they'll trowel from the middle out for pieces larger than a meter so that they're getting an adequate, adequate coverage on this. Um, a guy installing this can't reach all the way across one meter and pull that mortar across the surface. It goes to the, to the middle, working on both sides, making sure the uh, coverage is, is correct. I'm often asked about the, the, the thickness of the mortar coat that's holding this down, and typically a minimum bond coat thickness is going to be 3 sixteenths of an inch. So then the next part of this is we've spread the mortar both on the substrate and onto the tile. And now what we're going to do is we're going to embed this panel into the wall or to the floor. You, we picked it up using the suction cupped frame, placing it into, into place. And then what we're going to do is to making sure that we know that the trowel is giving the edges, rolling them over, starting to get them, uh, breaking them down. And what we're going to now do is using a high-speed sander or a weighted beaten paddle to making sure that that mortar is, is achieving that full contact between the substrate and the panel. And the sander, we start in the center of the tile, working ourselves out to the edges. And what this is doing, it's, um, it's like burping the tile. We're getting the air out from underneath it. Uh, we're forcing that air uh, to come out to the edges. And this is why the mortar is combed in the same direction on the, on the substrate and combed in the same direction on the panel. When they're placed together and you start forcing the air out, it's running out in one direction and, and um, getting that air uh, from being entrapped underneath the, uh, the panel, preventing the, tile, the panel from riding on a, um, uh, a barrier of air. We're forcing that out from underneath. Uh, for floors, uh, we're we're going to show a, a display here in just a minute by um, using small steps to remove the air. It's a walking a, spe a specific walking pattern uh, is detailed. Or again, I've seen the orbital sander being used or the large uh, weighted beat-in paddle. Uh, we're not using two by four beat-in blocks, but it's a larger panel to uh, help again forcing this air out. We're trying to control the lippage. Lippage is where you have a difference in the thickness bet um, between the two panels as they come together. And you don't want any lippage there because that can uh, form a tripping hazard. And one of the things with these larger gauge panels is that the design team is typically asking for a thinner grout joint. And if you have a difference in height between the two panels, it can become a tripping hazard, uh, especially for somebody in a, a spiked high heel, um, uh, catching the edge of the heel and, and causing a trip fall. So the lippage systems are used to help hold the panels together to be flush uh, going from one panel to the other. And there's various systems being used. The, the one that we're showing there is a wedge system, but there's others that can be used. And again, as part of this installation standard, if the installer is familiar with this installation standard, they know that a lippage system is mandatory to use in anything of a meter square or larger. A lippage system must be used. Then using the vibrating standard to exploit the thixotropic, thixotropic uh, properties of the mortar. The th what that means is that the that the mortar will flow if it's agitated, getting that full coverage underneath it. Um, another way of understanding thixotropic is comparing it to like ketchup. You, you hit the Heinz 57 bottle right on the number, the ketchup flows out, you've agitated it, let it sit there, and it'll hang. 
similar to thixotropic mortars for these larger format uh, panels, these gauge porcelain uh, panels, is that if you agitate the mortar, it'll flow, it'll it'll spread. Once you stop, that panel will hang or will sit in place. Uh, so using the right thixotropic mortar uh, for the installation. And then once the plan, the panel is in place, whether it's on the wall or floor, going through and cleaning out the joint and making sure that there's no mortar being squeezing up through the joint and um, uh, while the mortar is fresh. Uh, that way, when you go to grout, you'll have a nice clean grout joint. Um, use the, again, using the suction cup frame, lifting the panel into place. Uh, use uh, for walls, use the high speed sander or weighted bead in paddle, paddle to uh, getting the um, panel properly uh, locked into place. For floors, again, the Im embedding by small steps to remove air and increase the coverage. And we're going to show a little pattern on that in just a minute. This is again showing the panels being put up onto a wall application using the frame, the suction cup method. Here's we're showing a gentleman walking onto the floor, um, embedding the tile, the panel into the floor uh, using a sander on the wall. And here's a diagram of this is not a step or a dance uh, routine. This is uh, you get into the middle of the panel and walking to the edges. And what this does is it forces the air out and it's compressing the ridges of the mortar even more, to getting achieving that coverage at what we need so that there's no hollow spots underneath this panel that could cause for cracking or breaking later on. And again, somebody that goes through the installation qualifications and understanding the installation of these panels, gone through a certified program, understands how this is done and the importance of getting this done. So when we look at the required mortar coverage, walls, it's a minimum coverage of 80% in any single square foot. So if we're putting up a, a three foot by 10 foot panel, if you were to take back down the tile, there's gotta be a minute, or the panel, there's gotta be a minimum of 80% coverage in that square foot. So you're not gonna be seeing trowel marks. You're gonna see the, the mortar mushed over, embedded in the panel, embedded into it. On the floors, we're looking for a minimum 85% coverage in any single square foot. And no voids exceeding two square inches. And especially on a floor with a thinner material, if you get too large of a void, um, just the impact of a stiletto high heel could go through that material. And I've seen that happen because of lack of coverage. Coverage sufficiently distributed to support the edges in the corner. And again, that's very critical to making sure that the edges and the corners are properly supported, that the mortar has been combed all the way across, not held back at the edge, so that once secured, if you point load along that area, we don't end up with a cracked edge, which means the whole panel has to come out. It can be a very costly mistake. Um, allowable lippage is 132nd. Same as a current standard for, for traditional tile with a quarter inch grout joint or less. So typically uh, the installer or the designer, the specifier is looking for a tighter joint on these materials, an eighth of an inch, sometimes less than that. So the variation in lippage is a 32nd of an inch or less. If it's more than that, basically it's, it's if you're sliding a credit card across it and it's catching, you got too much lippage. Uh, grout joint shall be three times the variation in size of tile, never less than the 16th. And this is the same as the current ANSI language. So we're not, we're not going to go less than the 16th of an inch. Um, the nice thing with these gauge porcelain panels is that we can go into the 50% offset um, if you're doing um, a running bond pattern. Uh, with them because of the fact that you were not seeing the inherent warpage in these type of products in the firing process. Whereas when you get into the thicker tiles uh, in the firing process, you tend to have more warpage in the tile. So a three foot plank tile at typically three eighths of an inch in thickness, there'll be a crown in that tile. And we say not to offset in a running bottom pattern because you'll end up with a variation between the tiles and a, and a tripping problem. With these gauge porcelain panels, 
you're not running into that problem uh, and you can offset in a 50% pattern. The next thing that we have to be aware of is the fact that we ha still have to address the movement joint in this installation standard. This product expands and contracts at the same values as a traditional porcelain tile. So movement joints are critical in the finished application. Um, follow current uh, 108.01 and 108.02 requirements and use the TCNA handbook EJ171 and explains the placement of the movement joints, how often, where they're going in. Um, the current or the in uh, 2017, the TCNA handbook uh, changed uh, and improved the guidance on size and frequency of movement joints got a little more stringent in how they're putting in, and again, for the protection of the overall installation. Um, the location of an interior movement joint is no longer confined to a range. Interior movement joints shall be placed no more than 25 feet apart in both directions. So on the interior, every 25 feet in both directions, you need to have a movement joint. Exterior and interior movement joints, joints exposed to direct sunlight, moisture and above ground tile installations shall be spaced no more than eight to 12 feet apart in both directions. So that means if you're doing a showroom with a, a large uh, glass front and that sunlight is beating in there, you're gonna address that showroom floor just like an exterior application. Movement joints no further apart than 12 feet. The width of the movement joint can be determined by the spacing of the movement joints and the coefficient of thermal expansion of, this, of the tile. EJ171 contains a chart and formula to help determine the proper joint width. I get questioned all the time. We don't want the movement joint, or, or we want the movement joint to be the same size as the grout joint. Can we have a tighter movement joint? Yes, you can, but there's a formula that it has to be followed, and you may be placing a lot more movement joints. In some cases, I've seen installations where the panel instead of hard grouting it in, it's a soft joint around the full, around every panel. And this allows for this movement joint and the, and the use of a smaller, narrower joint. So it can be achieved. Refer to EJ171 in following through on that. Um, section 19 is the damage to tile work. Cure fully uh, before traffic is allowed. Um, tile. The tile contractor's obligation ceases after the completion and the cleaning. So if you're not properly protecting the tile, don't call the tile contractor back and saying the tile cracked because we rolled the forklift over it um, before it was ready to be um, put into use. Um, uh, making sure that proper uh, treatment is, is taken on these finished floors while construction continues on, um, whether we're um, covering it with um, just a craft paper or covering it with plywood or an OSB board uh, if the installation will be immediately open to traffic before uh, cure times are uh, properly achieved. So making sure that this is allowed and, uh, and, uh, and done. And then finally into the maintenance. All tile installations require periodic inspection and maintenance. Uh, it is important, it's the owner's responsibility to provide for routine inspection of appropriate maintenance and to, to ensure compatibility of all cleaning materials and products with the tile, the grout, and the mortar manufacturers. Uh, also the movement joints, if you're putting in the soft joints, making sure those are properly maintained and um, uh, replaced as needed. Um, appropriate maintenance requires requirements are determined by the site environment and the specific use of the installation. So you as a specifier, knowing that how this building is gonna be used, the amount of traffic, what, what's coming in on it, uh, to making sure that a, a proper maintenance program is put into place. And then finally, the protection uh, from light traffic for 24 to 48 hours so that the mortar is sufficiently set, protect from heavy traffic for seven days, protect from frost and rain for seven days um, before putting it into application. So in summary, Carefully review both the product and the installation standard. You saw by the standards that we pre presented today, this is not your typical ceramic tile. This is something different. Follow the tile and setting material manufacturer's recommendations for proper installation. 
just because it's the, the color and the pattern and the design that your client wants, make sure that you've talked to the manufacturer of the tile or the panel, I should say, and that that panel is suitable for the application you wanted to use it. And then check with the manufacturer of the setting materials to make sure that it's going to make a good, comprehensive, cohesive bond with the substrate that we're not going to have a failure. Make sure the type of installation is approved for its intended use. Is this for floor, in wall, interior, exterior? The service rating. Are we going to be running forklifts over this? Is it going to be used in a mall where thousands of people a day will be walking on it? Is it designed for that? Include in your specification the requirement for qualified installer. Very critical that you're doing this. Just because I've been installing tile for 20 years does not make me qualified for putting in these large of these gauge porcelain panels, making sure that the installer has gone through qualification. Just like you as an architect are taking AIA courses, you're sitting through this today to improve your knowledge of the industry, making sure that your installer has gone through a certification program to improve his knowledge of the industry, that you're gonna end up with a, a proper installation, a project that your client, our client, is gonna be happy with for the lifetime of that, of that building. Thank you. If, with that, let's open it up to any questions. Dan? Okay, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, perfect. The uh, first question real quick is, uh, what is the minimum grout joint width for tile panel? As you saw the, uh, this presentation, this question comes up all the time. Um, can we set a butt joint? Please don't. Minimum joint width is a 16th of an inch. Let's stay with that. Perfect. And then uh, for walls, does it require an expansion joint? And if yes, what is the interval length? Uh, yes, movement joints are required on walls the same as floors. And depending upon if it's interior or exterior, if it's interior, maximum di distance is every 25 feet, unless it's in direct sunlight, then the maximum distance is 12 feet. So in a lot of times, if it's a large panel and we don't want to be cutting it up and putting in a movement joint, the whole panel will have a soft joint around it rather than hard grout. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you, Mike, and thank you to our audience for joining us. Uh, this concludes today's presentation on gauged porcelain tile systems, and uh, we thank you again for joining us, and we hope that you'll join us for our next webinar presentation. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.